Hello and welcome to Projector and on this episode another hit TV series from the UK gets a big screen adaptation in Mrs. Brown's Boys The Movie. Found out Irish nanny Agnes Brown played by Brendan O'Cow is supporting herself running a family owned market store on Moore Street in Dublin which has come increasingly under threat from a politician played by Dermot Crowley who is in cahoots with Russian mobsters who want to build a shopping mall on the site. Agnes's store is being targeted next with a huge unpaid tax bill but with the help of her children Agnes is not going to give up her stool without a fight and takes them to court becoming a national hero in the process. In case you're not familiar with the show Mrs. Brown's Boys Agnes Brown is a character created by Brendan O'Cow and is inspired by his real life mother and he's been playing the character for oh, about 20 years now and he's been covering them at all kinds of different media. It starts off as radio skits, it moved into books, uh, it became plays, which inspired the TV series, which became this film. In fact, it's not even the first time that Agnes Brown has become a film character. In 1999, Angelica Houston actually played Agnes Brown in an adaptation of O'Carroll's book, The Mammy, which was called Agnes Brown. Yeah, they've kind of had to downgrade to Brendan O'Carroll himself, who's been playing the character ever since his stage incarnation. The thing about Mrs. Brown's Boys is that it is notoriously divisive, incredibly so. When it first came on television, I remember the critics were all over it, calling it the worst of the worst. It is a throwback in the worst sense, and yet it managed to get quite a following. In fact, so much so that it's become pretty much a mainstream hit. But it has won several BAFTAs. In spite of those critics, it has won several BAFTAs. And obviously, the critics have pillarized it for its outdated stereotypes and all that. I, you, I suppose you could argue it as Brendan O'Carroll being the Irish answer to Tyler Perry. Now, my personal opinion on the show is it's okay. It, you know what, I can see why the detractors don't like it, but it does have its charms because it is a throwback. It has made me laugh before now. I, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I laughed at it, but it did make me laugh. If you've never seen the show before, but you have seen uh, Ricky Gervais's extras, it's a little bit like um, his spoof version, When the Whistle Blows. It's a bit like that, but as an actual TV show. Make of that what you will. It is a guy dressed up in a fat suit made to look like an old woman. And if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, you don't. And believe me, that is especially true of the film. Because if you really hate the show, if you really hate it, and I know plenty of people who do, a lot of people who do, then you are really going to hate this movie. But testament to just how popular this show is by now is this movie got an absolute blockbuster opening last weekend. It did huge numbers in the UK and especially in Ireland. And that's understandable because it's been promoted for weeks on end. Everything that you could say about the show criticism wise is all up on screen. It is bigger than life and louder than ever before. Everything is here. And I think the reason why Mrs. Brown this boys works as a show and gets away with what it does is that it's filmed in front of a live studio audience. It started out as a play and it moved into a TV sitcom filmed in front of a live studio audience and that is pivotal to why it works so much because it has that laugh track, it has that live audience interaction. The film tries to replicate that in several ways which I'll get to but the point is that audience energy, that enthusiasm, that's what gives the show its life. And the movie has to move into a naturalistic setting. In one of the few smart things in the film, it opens with Mrs. Brown opening the door of her house and she walks out into a soundstage with the backdrop in front of her and she tears down the backdrop to reveal the Dublin streets and actual locations for the big musical number that the opening credits are set to, which is one of the few times the movie actually uses the scope of the cinematic scale to its advantage. In fact, it never does anything that grandiose ever again for the rest of its running time. The film is directed by Ben Kellett, who did a number of episodes of the TV series. He's worked exclusively in television, 
and he's never done a film before. You might be able to tell. I was somewhat surprised that O'Carroll didn't actually direct this himself, given that he's pretty much a one-man army, especially given that a number of the supporting players are actually members of O'Carroll's family or relations in some fashion. But he's instead deferred it to the series director, so he's obviously tried to replicate the feel of the TV show and tried not to stray too much. And to some extent, that's it's both, well, really it's to its detriment because it doesn't work as a film. It just doesn't work as a film. One of the things that Mrs. Brown's Boys does that is actually quite unique and has a hint of self-awareness about it is that Ocal he plays to the audience and he includes all the bloopers. Like, he will gesture his supporting players because they're family. They, you know, he... They know he's mucking around, so he basically pranks them, or they'll leave in bad continuity, or running around for a prop, or just generally deflating, you know, the verisimilitude for comedic effect, and that's actually some of the funniest stuff in the show. I think that's partially why I have a tiny little softbox for the show, is that it has that, and I, I kind of like that. The film tries to do that, and it just doesn't work. The way it tries to recapture that is to have the outtakes in the film, except it doesn't really do that. Instead, it's half an hour before something like that happens, and then they do it three times in the space of mm, roughly about 20 minutes or so, and then they don't do it again. Even the outtakes at the end of the credits largely aren't funny, except for the final one. The final one is genuinely funny. A little bit. Can you see how I'm straying to say that I didn't laugh very much? The problems especially come down to the storyline that they've chosen, in that it really is a half-hour episode, and not even a very good half-hour episode. Who says, you know what we should do to replicate the spirits of a high-energy, basically panto TV show? Oh yeah, let's make the plot about taxes and courtrooms. Honestly, guys, really? Really? Taxes and courtrooms? Could you think of a more boring setup? Speaking of boring, Mrs. Brown's Boys is notorious for very old gags, but in the film, they are so lethargic. There is no energy whatsoever. Nothing. The pacing is slack. It's all wrong. The performances are wrong, the editing's wrong, the direction is wrong. It doesn't even look very good as a film. It looks like a TV show. Still, come on, you've got a film! Use it! It even s like, like that opening gag with the backdrop, it's the movie! Scale! There's actually more outrageous stunts in an average episode of Mrs. Brown's Boys than there is in the film version, where they're actually free to have a budget. Ish. There's stereotypes abound. If you're familiar with the TV show, you know that one of the Brown's Boys is gay. He pops up in the movie, and it's just little token stuff. Like, he gets a little sequence where he plans to fundraise for Mrs. Brown, by swimming across to the, swimming across between Ireland and the UK, but of course he puts one he puts one toe in the water and he's like, oh, it's so cold. Doesn't sound that bad until you realise the character is wearing a bright pink mankini and a multicoloured swimming cap. Yeah, he's that kind of very flamboyant gay character. It's not really mean-spirited, which allows it to get away with very broad stereotyping like this, but even still. When you have Ocal come out as a second character called Mr. Wang, and you have him do some of the most offensive yellow face since Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's, there has to be a line drawn somewhere. Instantly, when Okao was promoting the uh, was promoting the film, he said that he has plans for two spin-offs, and Mr. Wang was one of them. Here's my response to that: No, 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 no. I'm just saying, it's not a very good idea. I don't think that character can stretch to an entire film. Instantly, I found it quite interesting how. Mrs. Brown and uh, Mr. Wang never share the same screen together. Yeah. It's that kind of amateurish. 
it's really quite embarrassing. I mentioned that it's a half an hour plot, and the movie doesn't even try to hide that. The gags are basically filler material. There are parts of the movie where it tries to take itself seriously, where it indulges in some really gross sentimentality, and those don't work because you don't care about Mrs. Brown in the film's version, because Mrs. Brown is annoying, and she's not funny, and she's always laughing at her jokes when they're not funny. And she's always telling people to feck off. And that doesn't count as a joke after the 17th time. In a testament to how much this movie thinks that swearing is funny, Mrs. Brown's defense barrister turns out to have Tourette's syndrome so that he can keep swearing and saying things like wank wank. The jokes are so weak. They are incredibly weak. It's not just that they're old. It's not just that they're so predictable that at one point you could literally time a bus to it. It's that they're just not funny. The whole thing is strained and laborious and it just feels so tired, especially on the big screen. And I don't mean to be mean because O'Carroll can be funny. I've seen him be funny. I've watched his television show. He can be funny. He's just not here. Shall we talk about some of the other gags that he fills his movie with that are just time-wasting? Comedic setups go nowhere here. A lot of them are showcases for the supporting cast, a lot of whom are mostly pushed to the background, and I know they're family and nepotism and all that, but uh, they're not very good actors, and I think they're very much aware of that. And they've gone on in the promotion about how the movie represents, in a way, how Dublin and many other cities in the UK have become homogenized, that they've become, that they've lost their sense of identity and that this market, it's important to keep it. And you know, maybe that might have been, you know, something they could have hung their movie on if it didn't feel so slapdash and it didn't feel like it was completely in the background the entire time. I'm not expecting it to be the world's end and make this point much more intelligently. I'm just expecting it to be funny. And that's the crucial thing here. None of this is funny. The bad guys in the film, Russian mafia types, they're not funny. They're really overused as comedy and they've never been funny. When is the last time you've seen any sort of Eastern European thug characters in a comedy be funny? And yet they're still trotted out. And of course we had the politician and we had that time on a joke where the politician has a position or a name that sounds like a swear word. In this case, they've come to a lot of effort so that his acronym spells prick. P-R-I-C. Yet, funnily enough, no one ever calls him that in the film. That is possibly the only time that Mrs. Brown's Boys has ever been subtle in its humour, in that it did not call a character that it blatantly had on screen being called a prick, being actually called a prick on camera. Incidentally, while I bring this up, the main bad guy in the movie just flat out disappears 20 minutes from the end. He just disappears. Like, we see him very briefly, and then he's never mentioned again. In fact, the whole ending of the movie, maybe the last half hour, is chase sequences. What blind ninjas! What diving into a river! Because what's going on here is that Mrs. Brown has asked her barrister to stall for her. But what she's actually doing is asking for the movie to stall whilst they extend this to 90 minutes. In fact, there's not one, but two whole sequences back to back where people have to rush to the courtroom that Mrs. Brown is in. They literally do the climax twice. And whilst we're doing that, we get a speech about how important it is, about social identity, which is only slightly less plausible than the one in Grace of Monaco. Only slightly less plausible, of course. And then it just stops. After all that, it doesn't even have a proper announcement. It just stops. Like, what? what's happening with the shopping mall development? What's going to happen with the fact that the guy running Dublin is completely corrupt? Why did we give Mrs. Brown's daughter a job in an advertising agency that is completely disregarded after the first scene it appears in? Nothing is wrapped up. And I don't mean that as sequel bait, as in nothing is wrapped up. It just feels like they got to 90 minutes and said, screw it. And even if you are absolutely the most diehard fan of Mrs. Brown, I think you're really going to have to struggle with this movie to find anything in it that's funny or rewarding. It's everything 
that Mrs. Brown's Boys does in half an hour, but worse. And yet, sadly, it did a huge number one at the box office. Thanks, UK and Ireland. Mrs. Brown's Boys The Movie is another wretched TV adaptation that serves no purpose being on screen other than being a monument to the show's massive popularity. Despite trying to replicate its TV counterpart, it may not move the title character out of her setting, but the removal of the studio audience has the same effect, and the charm to cover its many faults is in very short supply, as what Airjack in 30 minutes is downright leaden at 90. Only absolute completest fans of the show need apply for this laughless slog. In its defence, it is nowhere near as bad as the Keith Lemon or Harry Hill movies, but if he ends up doing a Mr. Wang spin-off because of this movie's success, that might be as bad as those two. I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.